Okay, okay everybody. Uh, welcome to to this ORF meeting. Uh, there's four speakers tonight, and and uh, I'll jump in and introduce each one as the star. I don't think the first one needs much introduction. Gareth Davis, one of our directors, who's just going to give us a sort of a overview of the opportunity before we stick into into the different parts of the project. Uh, uh, so over to you, Gareth. Yeah. So. Um... Why are we here today? Um, first reason is Orkney's experiencing, we're in it, and it's going to continue a level of unprecedented change. What's happened in the last three or four years has been you know, very, very different to past lives. What's going to happen in the next 20 years is probably going to be even more different to what's happened. So what we wanted to do is just explore some of that and how uh, climate, politics, economics, infrastructure, and community development might be affected. And another key thing is that as a community, we're going to have our best chance to influence that by working together and getting a kind of an understanding of what these changes and opportunities might hold and how we could react to them. We're not going to get 100% agreement, but at least if we've had a discussion and can look at the different options, then we can think about the best way forward and rather have things happen to us, we can be there and influence the things and guide them in the direction that's good for Orkney, as well as being good for the wider community. <clears throat> and this period of change happens against a, a backdrop of where Orkney has been incredibly successful at projecting itself locally, nationally, and internationally. The idea of Orkney the brand, which has been nurtured for well over 20 years now, has given Orkney a presence on the global stage, um, which is really excellent. But as we know, any reputation can be lost much more easily than it's gained. And so we need to think about how we maintain and enhance that hard one position going forward. And so the part of today is to share ideas from different perspectives, particularly around offshore wind, and see if we can get a collective opinion and, and uh, approach going forward. So the next slide shows you some of the changes that um, are in play and, and that will be happening um, over the coming years. And um, when I first produced this slide, it was all of this set. And then in the last 18 months, these three things have emerged. And rather than redo the whole slide, I just added them in as additional extras. But basically, if you look down there, you'll see all the things that we've been living through, the political turmoil, the economic changes, the social changes, the climate changes, um, the security situation, governance situations. All of these things have a profound effect on our personal lives, but also on our community and how we react to that wider world. So this is all of the changes that we need to think about in the context of, of what is good for Orkney and what's good for other people. And a key part of that is about economic benefits. And in different places, you'll hear about local pound, making money sticky, making sure that the money that gets spent in and around Orkney has an influence in the community. And money leads to jobs, it leads to wealth, it leads to enterprise, it leads to leveling up, just transitions, all of these things. So it's not just money for money's sake, but it's making sure that it's good money, it's not toxic money. And one of the issues that we have in Orkney is at the moment, um, some work that was done back in 2012 showed that only 20% of the pound that's spent in Orkney actually resides in or in circulates within our economy. The other 80% goes south. And obviously money going south doesn't have a benefit here in terms of the wider benefits that we create. So when we look forward, if that's the, if you like, the recent situation, one question that may come to mind is, can we make that better in the future? Can we hold on to more than 20% of what is spent in Orkney? And if we can make that margin go from 20% to 30%, which still leaves those south with 70% of the pie, we just double the amount of wealth that we circulate within our economy. So the margins for us can have an immense benefit with very little penalty to the other people that are involved 
in that process. Um, and if you're thinking, well, that's, that seems an incredibly large number. If you just think about who you pay money to and think about where they're based, you think about Scottish and Southern Energy, where their profit goes to, you think about Tesco's and Lidl, you think about McGregor's, you think about Highlands Industrial Supplies, you think about all of the places where you spend money, an awful lot of it goes out as profit. And all that we get here are the jobs that come with it, but we don't get that wide away. <laughs> So the other important, perhaps even more importantly, is the carbon transition challenge. And this slide um, shows, is it, are we able to move that or is that going to, does that take everybody offline? No, it doesn't, it just moves them. Okay, great. So um, what this graph shows is the, the way in which, um, we produce energy. So this is all energy. This isn't just electricity. This is fuel as well. And at the moment, we have a system that's dominated by carbon, which are in the blues. Um, and we've got a little bit of uh, electricity, which is often coming from carbon. And then we've got um, a little bit of even smaller amount of renewables. And in the future, what this is showing is that we're going to have a lot less energy. So hopefully we're going to be more efficient in how we use energy. But also we're going to have a much bigger increase in electricity, and hopefully that's not going to be coming from carbon, it's going to be coming from renewables. And we also have got this green area, which is hydrogen, and there's a choice about where that comes from, and hopefully that can come from renewables to a large extent as well. So that yellow and green bit is the bit where Orkney and the area around here is going to play a role. So if we look at the amount of energy that's encapsulated by that part of the graph, it requires an installed capacity of around 100 to 150 gigawatts of installed offshore wind. So that's 100,000 to 150,000 megawatts. So, you know, the turbine out here at uh, Hatston, it's 100,000 equivalent of that. So it's a lot of renewables. But that's what we need to decarbonize the whole of the UK. So where is that going to come from? So this map at the bottom, some work done by Oxford University, shows the bright green areas are the most cost-effective places to generate that energy from in terms of offshore wind. And what it shows is that the waters around the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland are some of the cheapest, most cost-effective areas for generating offshore wind. So there's a natural focus for activity to come here. Next slide. So that need is against the backdrop where Orkney has played a leading role in energy in many different ways over the last 20 or so years. Um, when we started off in, um, actually in the 1990s, Orkney was the, one of the worst places in the UK for carbon emissions. We've now migrated to the, being the 20th worst per capita so we've, we've got better, but not a whole lot better. And the reason for that is that per person, we use a lot of hydrocarbons at the moment in our houses, in our transport, and with the Flotter terminal there as a big industrial site, which isn't spread across so many people. We have that responsibility. Um, but the community has really reacted to that. And since 2013, we've produced enough renewable energy to offset the electricity that we use. We still have to deal the fuel we put in our cars and we put in our heating system. And there's many other ways in which over the years, the community has shown that it's ready to take on energy challenges. Um, but if you can think back to the last slide, we've got, you know, a thousand times what we've done, if you like, that's going to happen around us. And the question is, what role can we play in that? And are we actually going to how do we best organize ourselves to maximize that opportunity in the best way possible? Okay. Oh, if we can go back one, that would be great. Well, someone move it on. Okay. That's the next one. No, that's great. Okay. So we're putting some scale to that, <clears throat> that 100 to 150 gigawatts. This map shows 
the areas where the existing Scotland round is distributed, and that's the solid red squares. The open red squares show territory that's being bid on at the moment under what's called the Intog round, and the orange open squares show an indication of where future capacity to get up towards 100 to 150 gigawatts could be placed. Um, now, that in itself has many issues associated with it relating to fishing, shipping, and other users in those areas. This background map is produced by Marine Scotland, and the degree of greenness shows the level of constraint. So the dark green areas are more constrained in terms of offshore wind than light green areas. And so we've tried to place the orange bits in lighter constrained areas. But it's, it's not necessarily a crowded sea, but it's a busy sea, and it has great strategic importance. So we need to think carefully about where that stuff positioned. But one of the other things that's really interesting is in terms of reaching that installed capacity, it has some physical requirements in terms of wind turbines. So if you do the maths, it basically works out that to produce that amount of installed capacity, we would need as a country to install somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 wind turbines. And that's got to be done to achieve net zero by 2050 in the UK and 2045 in Scotland. That has to be achieved by 2045. Um, so number of days in that period, there's 7,300 days and counting. So basically we're close to having to produce more than one turbine a day over 2025 to 2045 to achieve that target, which is an industrial exercise presents some challenges, but also some opportunities. So if we're going to produce more than a turbine a day for 20 years, um, we need to think about places, A, where that can be manufactured. So places like Invergordon, expecting to be rolling a lot of steel and, and producing a lot of structural frames. The places that build turbine blades are going to be producing turbine blades. The places that are produ producing the cells are going to be producing the cells at a very fast rate. But all of that has to come together somewhere. And when we looked at the places where that might happen, that's a really challenging exercise because these turbines are big. They, they'll have a base of about 80 metres wide, and you can see some of the scale models here. They'll be 300 metres to the tip. And Invergordon and Teesside and Tyneside and Firth of Forth and the Clyde, and these places that are bidding for work haven't got the capacity to store, uh, to assemble all of these turbines as well as producing them. So there's a gap in, in capacity, and that's what people are starting to think about when you'll see today through the presentations for Orkney. And it's not just the one and a bit turbines per day, because when the weather's bad, you might need to store a couple of turbines for a couple of days, and you need to have all the equipment that's coming in to assemble them ready for the next day's operation as well. So that's in physical terms, the scale of the opportunity. And the question is, is how uh, can Orkney best react to that? And Scapa Flow, as we'll hear in the other presentations, is a key asset because it's the largest natural harbour in the Northern Hemisphere, as we know, and it's an incredibly effective harbour. And in questions, in, in, one of the other questions is over the timescales of when this is needed. So is this something that's going to be a long term into the future? And as I showed there, I've kind of anticipated work starting in 2025 um, or about then. So the Scott wind round that you'll hear about, people are generally looking to start installing turbines around 2030, 2029, 2030. But the Intel ground, which is currently being leased, may actually come sooner than that, and so that might be around 2025 onwards. And one of the challenges is that the later you leave it, the bigger the crush will come to get to the target of 2050. Um, or that goes out longer, and obviously that has a lot of implications as well. So what you can see here is an indication of where we are. We're at the start. There's development activities happening. Um, so there's people gearing up. There's hundreds if not thousands of people getting recruited to start to implement this work. And as a community, we then need to perhaps start readying ourselves to engage with those groups and be in a position where we can influence the plans, not just respond to them, 
and be able to input the experience and the expertise that we've got that we'll hear a bit more about from some of the other speakers. And then getting towards the end of this kind of set scene setting is, what is it that Orkney can best contribute? So if we look to our southern cousins, say on the Cromarty Firth, they're hell-bent on uh, metal bashing. They want to build things, they want to weld things. Any of you that have driven up the A9 recently, you'll see the structures sitting there. And But Orkney is never going to be in that business. We, we don't see ourselves, I think, as a construction fabrication location. Um, but what we can do is maybe look to our maritime heritage and look for some of those activities and see how we can play a role there. But as well as that kind of sharp end activity, we've also got quite a big um, heritage in terms of the planning for energy activities, the academic activities that have happened at ICIT, um, and some of the, the softer intellectual things that sit around wind. So it's not just producing things with a spanner or a screwdriver, it's actually thinking about things, analyzing things, collecting data and handling that. And then when we produce the energy, we've got the flutter oil terminal, which obviously has sat there for 40 years producing and handling oil. And you know that's a, an asset that could start looking at hydrogen production. And there's very active uh, activities looking at that transition and creating a long-term future for it. So looking at the energy market and how we distribute and use energy is also important as well as how we plan for that uh, in, the, in the first place. So just to wrap up then, you know, the, if you like the standards that we want to apply to that. So, you know, Orkney is an incredibly beautiful place. It's a fantastic place to live. Um, it's got great robustness in many ways, but it's also got fragilities as well. So what we need to do is think about ways of developing what we would are appropriate for it. And in line with the sustainable development goals, which are universally adopted around the world as gold standards in terms of how things can and should change. But it's our reflection on those. It's not somebody else telling us. It's us actually thinking as a community, what do we want that reflects the ambitions that are set out in those goals? And hopefully the presentations that you'll hear tonight will set out some of the answers to those questions. I think that's... Okay, thanks very much, Gareth, for setting the scene. That's uh, very useful, and it is a massive sort of scene that we're, we're seeing. Uh, and as, as we know, as Gareth mentioned in his, his, his uh, presentation, scapa flow is critical to that, and we're going to hear a bit more detail about that now. So I'm going to ask Paul Ophoy, who's the development manager for Orkney Harbour, to, to give us a bit more detail on what the harbours are planning is to, to, to take advantage of this opportunity. So thanks, Paul. Thank, thanks very much, Ian. And while Mike's trying to desperately find my presentation, I am indeed Paul Olvoy. My full title is uh, Business Development Manager of Orkney Harbour Authority. Um, I'm going to be unashamedly very much ports and harbours based uh, in the presentation that I've got. So I'm going to touch a little bit on the projects which you can see in the rooms here and a little bit of an update on those, but also touch around the rest of Scotland and some of the other ports, some of the other things that are happening around there as well. Or if Mike doesn't find my presentation, I'll be singing and dancing for the last five minutes of the <laughs> presentation. Um, no pressure, Mike. Um, so uh, just, just to sort of set the scene uh, a little bit, um, obviously Orkney Harbour Authority is owned by Orkney Islands Council. The projects and everything that you show there, these are Orkney Islands Council projects owned by the council. We are just a part of that that uh, acts for uh, them, obviously, in the marine environment. Um, Gareth touched on Invergordon and things like that. And um, some of you may have seen who've been on our social media. Yes, we have one. Uh, fall, in fact. Um, you would have seen our tugs actually working in Invergordon. So we have three brand new tugs. Uh, and they've been out there working uh, hard, moving the equipment around. So there's uh, certainly one bit of experience that we've got in the marine environment from ourselves is our tug crews are now getting used to moving barges with a lot of big developments uh, on them. Um, that's, that's it. That's what you wanted? Yep. Fine. Uh, move it yourself, though. Um, it's coming off this machine, so if you just oh, step forward yourself. You see, Gary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yourself. Get Excellent. And I just like to say this this is my work home. So my office is actually just through there. 
uh, with the team from Naomi, Arch Henderson and everything like that. Those that you don't know me or see me, you'll see me in the window often sat there uh, with my uh, cruise coordinator. We'd run uh, all of the business development side on the shipping. So I'm responsible for not just the offshore wind, but obviously the oil and gas and the cruise as well. But if anyone's ever passing by, just, you know, tap on the window and uh, uh, and I'll have time to get out the back door and uh, you get older. Right, I won't be long. Uh, there's a bit of overlap um, with what Gareth's already presented, um, but I'll just quickly go through some of the things. The Orkney Harbours Master Plan Phase 1, um, I'm sure you're on it, I'm not going to go into detail. It does say approved in April 2020, it does not mean it's been built. That's just saying approved as we're moving on to the next stages. And again, what you're seeing there is a basic sort of reiteration of what Gareth said and what I'm sure you all know. It's this incredible asset of not only being well positioned, but having those uh, marine natural assets, uh, along with a lot of wind that we have, that means that we've got uh, an optimal position to uh, benefit from the marine renewable sector and this rush, obviously, towards offshore winds. And I'm sure you've also seen these maps around many times. I mean, one of the, the, the standouts still, and you're nearly about one year since Scott Wind was announced, is this huge figure, which is now 27.6 gigawatts of offshore wind, a of potential offshore wind, uh, dotted around Scotland, but very much around the north and the east. This huge amount of projects. And uh, I think Al touched on the number of turbines to be made. Um, you know, you're looking at huge amounts of investment. Uh, west of Orkney are looking at a four billion pound investment for their site, and they're not the largest. So it's it's absolutely something which um, is world leading, world beating. I will say on the flip side of that that government do have an issue of actually achieving. So achievement of that, achieving of that is going to be difficult. But there is a huge opportunity, as we've said, and of course it's not just Scotland. There's Scotland Plus. There's the Intog Rounds, uh, as we talked about a little bit there, and already some existing sites. And of course, the existing sites that are ongoing at the moment, sites that are being built, that are being developed at the moment, they're actually taking some of that capacity that we're seeing uh, that we mentioned, and I'll go into a little bit of that later. So I mentioned Intog. Uh, again, you'll see these maps uh, going around. Um, it, it's just more of the same. It's a different thing. And the interesting thing with Intog is it could come ahead of Scotland. So this is going to be something which is more innovation-based, small scale, less than 100 mega, uh, megawatts, as you can see in some of them. So very much going to be looking as the startup and maybe even as a pathfinder for some of the, the larger scale developments. <laughs> what you've probably seen up here many times, I took this snapshot, I think 11, yeah, 11 o'clock yesterday. Um, and it just, just backs up. I use this a lot when you're sort of talking about, um, you know, why have we got that 27.6? Why is it suddenly? Why is it all looking at that? And of course, what we're looking at is, is demand generation, what we're taking from Europe, um, as well as, of course, what we need to eliminate by a set point. And this was yesterday, I got what sort of thing. So 52% of the UK generation was renewables, but still 16% of fossil fuels. And again, you can see that that's there. It may only be five gigawatts, but of course, there's five gigawatts from uh, Europe as well. So 10 gigawatts immediately which is to be replaced. Um, and obviously other ones which will come off and on as the need fit. So I use that a lot just to show uh, as a sort of a case study around uh, uh, some of the examples. And you actually can go on that live if you just Google it. That shouldn't probably all do, but it's quite interesting sometimes to see what uh, the UK generation is looking at. Uh, right, I'll just move on to it. Again, you can see the model from here. Um, the projects that I'm certainly involved with uh, Scapa Deep Water Key, uh, Hassan Pier, as we're going to call it, or the logistics base, uh, and also Lioness. Uh, technical details of that, which you can see, which you can see in the models and that, it's basically what the industry wants in certain places. Huge land area, a lay down area, deep water around it, and a key to pull alongside or somewhere to come alongside. Uh, that's the requirements of offshore wind. But that requirement is as close as possible to the developments. Uh, I also use, I haven't got it here, but I use a case study of the Kincardine offshore wind, the floating wind farm. Uh, basically, I'm not going to use the word disaster, but it didn't work very well because they had to tow. Everything was made in Spain, towed to Rotterdam to be assembled and then towed across to Aberdeen to get uh, put into place. And it was proven that that just does not work. That doesn't actually work that way. You have to be as close to the sites as possible 
for uh, you to reduce the weather windows for the ship. Towing a vessel, towing a big structure is very difficult. We're going to have some harsh climate up here. So obviously having those bases so close to the sites is critical for the developers. We're very lucky that we have, as Gal said, the largest natural harbour in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and that's there. What we don't have is a facility on it at the moment to interact with the shore side to give a stable base for the developers. So this is obviously the proposal from uh, Orkney Island Council. I'll just update a little bit on the progress because I know some of you have been a bit more involved with this uh, than what we, we, we have done. There's a variety of things there. I'm not going to read through all of them. The ones in blue uh, have been completed. There has been a change in the actual design. For those of you that can see the model, brilliant, you get a model and it's out of date, uh, is that this, um, I won't go that close because I'm going to loom in the camera there, but there is a spur on the side of phase three, which has now been removed uh, for what we're going to do is some extra dredging to get down towards the 20 metre depth. Uh, it also has the added benefit of saving 5% on the cost of the project. And again, that means that we just have that long sweep of, um, of key. It's simplifying things a little bit. Um, you'll see also, uh, those that know, we've appointed uh, EIA consultants. The work on, is ongoing on that. The stakeholder engagement in this room going on all the time, with Naomi and the team, uh, people coming in, open days. Next one's tomorrow. That's it. Please come back. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot of people coming in to see that, asking the questions which you can see on the board, asking us for some of the details. We've got things like procurement strategy to do, tender design. So there's a lot of work that's been done, but there's a lot of work still to go on. And this is just what you're doing as the background to develop that project to a point where you can see that, A, you know, have we got something that is um, feasible and in the sense that there is going to be obviously a clear decision to go ahead. We're not at that point yet. In fact, on the bottom there, it's just at the, um, the very bottom, is the um, developer uh, engagement as well. Uh, that's a key role for me, uh, obviously talking with the developers over the past couple of years, uh, all of them, they all show a great interest in Orkney. They realise the benefit of Orkney they realise the experience of Orkney and they like to sort of get involved. And that's where it's not me doing that, it's everyone being involved uh, with the developers. Um, I know certainly, you know, Gareth and the team, have, I've met with them many times, if not more than myself. Very important to, to keep that engagement going and then stepping that up through the different layers, through things like the Deep Wind Cluster, through Scottish Government, UK Government, looking at those opportunities to make sure Orkney is on the map. Uh, I'll just quickly touch on logistics space. Again, uh, you can see uh, what um, my, my whole world there, ferries, crews, and all fill vessels, um, is, is obviously the extension of that. You all know Hatston Pier, it's a straightforward extension, but this will make 685 metres of key length of 10 metres of water depth. Uh, it will not be a huge, massive 685 metre cruise terminal, but will give us a space to do cruise and other things as well at the same time, linking that infill area to the uh, shoreline so that we can actually make a well-spaced, well-designed, well-thought-out area where we can do operations. And part of that work is actually talking with the harbour users to define uh, and refine this uh, project on that. Lioness is part of it. Lioness, uh, early conversations obviously talk, why aren't we doing something bigger? Lioness, uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but it is a key part of the development. It's a huge space, it's a huge area, which can be used for... Uh, lay down storage. Um, it is part of the project in a cost, which you'll see shortly. Um, and it does obviously have a good key on that at the moment. Um, it is it is an absolute asset and there is going to be work going on there, I think, because you need to store a huge amount of chain and equipment and Lioness is absolutely ideal for that. Uh, on the other side, it's also perfect for little cruise ships to go alongside to go to the wonderful new museum there. So again, you can see opening out uh, through other things that were opportunities that we have Project costs, um, yeah, millions, I'm afraid, not 286,000 pounds. Uh, <laughs> there will be a collection at the end, and I'll be telling you things at the end. Optimism bias or without optimism bias, we all know that obviously big, big projects cost with optimism bias. You have to look, you know, your assurance of how that project is going to go, but they're hefty, and you can see the figures of what they are. But there's no surprise in that because um, I wasn't expecting that when the slides come up, but it has been mentioned. Already, Floss Hydrogen Hub, separate projects in West of Orkney, uh, with, with Repsol and Total working on that, but a key cornerstone, because as we see the number of oil ships leaving Flotter, 
that then declines. We don't want to see FOSA close. We don't want to, to lose that income ourselves. So there is actually an opportunity for uh, Flutter to diversify. Oh, no, this one's going to be me leaning forward all the time. Project costs, I talked about that. Um, you saw those figures up there. Um, I'm just going to skip through all of these because um, you don't see me looming at the camera every five seconds. Every port got development ideas. Every port has got big projects. Every port needs funding. The big one at the front there, 400 million, it's going to be half a billion by the end of that for Aberdeen South. Maximum ships up to 300 metres, can't even get the biggest cruise ships that we get in here into Aberdeen South, but it's half a billion pounds. 150 million for Cromarty for their expansion plan um, and the various <laughs> amounts of other figures. Scottish National Investment Bank, you know, again, these stories you see coming out all the time, wanting to invest in the northeast Scotland supply chain, but actually opening out there, the discussions going wider, investment needed. But then you've got all those ports, all those ports wanting to do work that's going to be able to uh, get them to grow. But at the moment, we have nothing signed up. We don't have the developers signed up. They are moving forward in a different time scale. So all of the ports look at this and have to say, well, who's going to fund us and where are we going to start getting the money from this? How is this going to work? And this is where governments and governments is, right, it's plural, and that has to work together with the port sector to be able to develop these infrastructure because all of those being done on there still would put the fact that there will be capacity issues uh, for Scotland. And no matter what we do, whether it's just restrictions on depth, there's restrictions uh, around entrance and everything like that, we do have that prime optimal location here at Scapa Flow with very few restrictions. How am I doing for time? I'm all right. Can I go on? Yeah. <clears throat> You'll regret that, Ian. Um, <laughs> I use this again, case studies, really important. Stolen away deep water, the one I didn't put up on there. But this is a £49 million development. It's ongoing at the moment. I love the way that Stolen Away have actually put a cruise ship on there instead of making offshore wind. Shows where they're <laughs> thinking, I think. But this is a new uh, facility that you don't know, close to the Arnish Yard. It's going to be connected by this new road that runs along. It's got six hectares of laydown area. It's quite limited, hence why the Remington look at uh, cruise. It's going to have a row, row berth on as well. But if we look at how that was funding, the breakdown of funding and how the model of funding for port infrastructure and where we as a council, you know, have to put uh, pressure onto different departments, you can see there's 11.8 million from high, 1.8 million Marine Scotland's. The Port Authority, 1.5 million invested in that and 33.9 million from the council. But that council funding was backed by the Scottish government through a growth accelerator mechanism. So basically, as they hit targets, the money goes back to the, so the Scottish government provide that money, but it goes back to them at some point. So it's almost like it's um, uh, not a guarantee, but it is provided in a way to get the project done. It's a project that's ongoing. It's a project that's ongoing. It will have work through ships undoubtedly, but it's a small area. It's not going to do some of the biggest things it's going to do. It's at 10 metre water depth. So it is restricted to some of the developers' plans and ideas. Final bit, you'll be very happy to know. Uh, this one here, I'm just leading into what some of the big work that we're doing at the moment around our outline business case. So the outline business case, which pulls together all of the work that we're doing using um, some of the assumptions that we get from developers, putting all of that in, putting our charges into that, working out what the costs will be for developers using Orkney Harbour Authority area. So that's really like critical that we have that outline business case that we share with developers and we can share with government and that they can see that there is a funding opportunity for whatever we need to do. Um, and that just puts into where we are on the, on the line thing that we don't have the existing at the moment. Um, Linus is not being suitable, but that investment in infrastructure is needed and is then indeed critical. I can't remember if this is the last one or not, but the context of that is, of course, the Green Book, Treasury Green Book Standard um, um, business case. Um, it's based on the issues, constraints, and opportunities that are everything in there. So everything goes into that, goes into jobs, it brings out your MPVs, GVAs, all of those things that people think, well, the heck does all that mean? But it all goes in there so that when you are looking at funding opportunities, when you're going to government, that's what they want to see. The Treasury Green Book Standard developed ideas that everything is now written down perfectly for them so they can understand where you're getting at. And you can see the significant stakeholder engagement since day one. I don't know what we call day one, but day one is up to there. And the OBC is actually almost a, an organic thing. It is being significantly updated. We've got to a point there. It continues as it is. It can be shared. But changes come in as we get 
uh, feedback from others as things change in the marketplace that we can then be able to um, update and change that iteration. Final slide. Did I say that was the final slide? Final slide. Uh, assumptions. And these are the assumptions which we put into that. The assumptions, which is the actual facts, the developers, the time, the number of turbines, the work that they're going to be doing, how they're going to do that. Because every developer, and some of them don't have an idea, but every developer have a different way of how they're going to get equipment out of site, equipment into the, 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 the base, how that's all going to work together. The size of the components, I mean, these are something that you look at. 6,000 tonnes of the anchors, chains and moorings for floating offshore wind, if they go that way. Floaters are 4,000 tonnes. Huge amounts of equipment. That all works out then again into the size of vessels that we'll be seeing and why you need to go to certain sizes on, on, on that. Our harbour dues, how we will then charge that out. Um, and then the key assumptions based around uh, the timing, which is, again, very critical. If everyone tried to build in 2030, for instance, mm -hmm. just wouldn't happen. You know, obviously it wouldn't happen. You wouldn't even get the ships. Those ships don't exist that will uh, be able to service these wind farms. So all of that goes into the OBC, and all of that then develops uh, something that we can share with everyone. And that was the last one. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, excellent. Uh, so we're now going to move to one of the developers, uh, 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 the West of Orkney Wind Farm, uh, uh, Jack Farnham, who's going to speak and just tell us a little about where they're at as a little feed into that. He should be online. He's not in the room, so he should be online, hopefully ready to give can us... You, can you hear me? I, I can hear you vaguely. Uh, just give us a minute to get some of the technology in place so we can see you as well, Jack, and that'll be great. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have been with you in person, Unfortunately, yeah, the, the primary school teachers are on strike in Edinburgh today. Uh, so, yeah, I was, I was drafted into more urgent uh, homeschooling this morning. Um, but, yeah, my name is Jack Farnham. I'm the development manager for the West of Orkney Wind Farm. Uh, I'll just run you through a, a few quick slides, just uh, giving you an introduction to the project partners, the project itself, and then looking ahead into the kind of project development and some of the work that we've been doing uh, and are planning in terms of the supply chain skills development. And I'll touch on the Flotta Hydrogen Hub, something which um, Paul and others have touched on briefly. So the West of Orkney Wind Farm it brings together a, a, a sort of three separate companies under a joint venture. Those companies are Corio Generation. So Corio Generation is part of the Macquarie Group. So Macquarie are the world's largest infrastructure investor uh, and they uh, effectively are developing uh, projects, 20 gigawatts of projects uh, around the globe. Uh, we're also working with Total Energies, who are uh, you know, uh, an existing oil major, uh, and they themselves are going on a, an energy transition as they move from oil and gas more into renewables. So they're targeting 35 gigawatts of renewable projects by 2025 and uh, up to 100 gigawatts by 2030. And lastly is the Ridge Renewable Infrastructure Development Group, which is a, a company myself and others uh, started up in 2017, specifically targeting the West of Orkney wind farm site. We saw the value uh, and the opportunity in having a fixed uh, bottom, so a fixed foundation. Uh, wind farm site in the Scotland process. So this is our kind of vision, if you like, our sketch of how we think the project will progress. So we secured the rights to develop the site uh, from uh, Crown Estate Scotland back in 17th of January last year. It's been a pretty busy year, uh, 2022 and 2023 looks like it's going to be fairly busy too. Uh, but it's a, a 2,000 megawatt site, so that's two gigawatts. It's enough to power approximately 2 million homes. Uh, it'll be up to 125 turbines, which would be around uh, 28 kilometres to the west of Hoy. We're looking at two offtake options. So a uh, grid connection down to the Spittal substation in Caithness. And then we're also exploring an option to power the Flotta Hydrogen Hub. So that's that'll be a private wire connection. So a private connection between the wind farm and Flotta, effectively to transfer electrons from the wind farm uh, into the hydrogen hub. And again, the, the kind of attraction for Flotta is 
uh, again, Scapa Deep Water Key, the ability uh, to essentially uh, export uh, hydrogen into the global market, uh, either on vessels or into the UK market via pipeline. As Paul mentioned, you know, we're one of the developers who are interested in using the Scapa Deep Water Key. So we would like to effectively use Scapa Deep Water Key to lay down equipment, organize equipment ready for a construction campaign. And we'd hope to start construction offshore in around 2027, the first power in 2029. And then the construction schedule would be around five years um, offshore from 2027 through to 2032. We're also working with uh, Scrabster Harbour with a view to making our operations and maintenance port. So that would be a sort of a, a 35 year kind of contract effectively with Scrabster Harbour Trust to operate out of, out of that port. Uh, I guess just some background in terms of, you know, why the option agreement area is the shape that it is. Uh, you know, we did a lot of work in terms of looking at constraints over the site, uh, the first being bathymetry, so the water depth. So there are two relatively shallow banks. There's a uh, stormy bank, which is to the north of the option agreement area, and then Wittenhead Bank, which is an area to the south. So those are two relatively shallow banks, uh, about 40 to 70 meter kind of water depth. And that's that's what we're targeting for fixed bottom projects. You can just begin to see, you know, there are over 300 layers of constraints and stakeholder analysis that we did to identify the option agreement area. So this is very much a simplification of that. But you can see some of the constraints that we tried to avoid, like the helicrop to main route service in the oil fields to the west of Shetland. We tried to maintain sight lines between the mainland of Scotland and Orkney. Um, obviously, we're stepping clear of uh, shipping routes and we're conscious, mm -hmm. obviously, of the Sutherland Space Hub, uh, who will, I hope, be launching uh, satellites in the, in the near future from the north of Scotland. Uh, this is just a kind of uh, a view of the bathymetry that I mentioned. So that's a Stormy Bank to the north and Whittenhead Bank to the south. These are both suited more to fixed foundations, so driven into the seabed. And then there's potential for an area in the centre, uh, which could be suited to floating. But our first application is really sort of focused on um, yeah, making connection to Caithness first, and then we will uh, come back to consent a connection, we hope, to power the Flotta Hydrogen Hub. And the reason for effectively pushing towards Caithness first is that we have a signed grid connection agreement. So we have a contracted position with National Grid that we need to provide power to the grid by 2029, and indeed they need to be in a position to receive it. Um, and then we're working with Flotta and we're looking towards a sort of connection uh, timescale of around 2030 to connect to the Flotta hydrogen hub. This figure just shows some of the refinement that's been kind of ongoing within the project, looking at kind of broad cable corridors uh, and refining those down uh, to the offshore consent sort of boundaries that you can see here for the first consent application, which we hope to launch uh, this summer. This is just uh, again a quick overview. You know, it's 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 been a fairly uh, intense start. As I said, we awarded the site back in seventeenth uh, of January last year, and we immediately kicked off our virtual public exhibition because of Omicron. We couldn't do it face to face. Um, we we issued our scoping report to. Uh, Scottish ministers to the Highland Council and to Orkney Island Council. Um, fortunately, we were in, in a position that we could get out and meet the public during the summer. So we had a number of summer shows in Orkney, Caithness and Sutherland. Um, all of our seabed surveys uh, and offshore surveys were completed uh, last year, which was uh, quite a task to get yeah, aerial bird marine mammal surveys complete. We had our seabed mapping uh, surveys were completed with agreement with uh, the local fishing industry, marine traffic surveys underway, 
Uh, and then at the end of uh, November, beginning of December, we had our first pre-application public consultation event. So effectively, we did a kind of a number of uh, venues. I think there's six venues across the north of Scotland. And I think we had 286 uh, attendees through the doors uh, in each of those venues uh, across all events, sorry. Uh, and we had, I think, 180 attendees in Orkney, um, which I'm told is, is pretty good going for a public consultation. Uh, all the information that is uh, or was presented is, is still on our website, westoforkney.com. And you can still go into the communities tab and there's a, a virtual exhibition with all of the panels and information that was presented there. Uh, this year, 2023, yeah, effectively we're in a process, we're kind of synthesizing all of the survey results that we captured last year, beginning to synthesize some of the public feedback that we received and we're kind of beginning to build up our environmental impact assessment uh, and build up the application uh, documentation itself, quite a task um, to pull, pull that together. Yeah, we're hoping to have our second round of pre-application consultation events at the end of March. Uh, again, we'll be back in Orkney in the north of Scotland. Uh, and we should complete our onshore surveys on Caithness um, by the end of March, uh, with a view to submitting our offshore consent applications in the summer. And then we'll be submitting our onshore consent applications to the Highland Council for the Gearing Connection um, yeah, this autumn. And then uh, effectively we're, we're in the lap of the regulators at that point, but we'd hope to have consent for the project in 2024. So we're in a position to start offshore construction in 27 and get first power by 2029. I'll just scoot on to uh, yeah, some of the work we've been doing in terms of uh, the development services. Uh, I think Gareth mentioned it at, at the start, you know, a lot of money is, is, is flowing south from Orkney. Um, and I'm glad to say that we're actually uh, contracted with a number of, of uh, companies on Orkney, and hopefully some of that money is beginning to, to flow back north. Uh, you know, we've got Exodus on board who are based in Stromness. They're our lead EIA coordinator. And indeed, we've got a number of uh, members of the development team who've been seconded directly into the project. Um, we're using Orca to help with our marine archaeological surveys. Uh, we've got EMEC on board uh, with a multi-million pound um, innovation programme as well. So... Uh, there are some significant pieces of work, I hope, beginning to land uh, in Orkney and indeed, uh, during, certainly on the environment consent side, I think over 90% of the contracts that we've landed to date uh, are UK-based companies and indeed, uh, whenever possible, Scottish companies we really do value uh, local knowledge and, and local expertise. In terms of how the project's uh, grown, uh, from our, you know, our standing start last year, we've now got around 40 full-time employees within the project and we've got about 140 contractors working for the, you know, working, working with us. Uh, so this is just a, a very much a snapshot of, of some of the services that are being provided just now. Looking ahead to the actual project itself, you know, we made a commitment in the bid that we would like to increase UK content to 60%. Now, the current UK content in offshore wind farms is around 20%. So, uh, you know, it's quite a challenge to triple the UK content, um, you know, uh, yeah, from, from where we are today. Uh, and indeed, We've also set an ambition out ourselves that we would like to try, where possible, to push UK content higher, which would be up to around 70%. So that's our sort of push target um, for the supply chain in the UK. And we're not going to be able to do that just by waiting uh, for the supply chain to, to spool up. 
uh, and meet the project needs. So the project partners have put forward a £105 million uh, supply chain investment programme. Uh, and that we, we're, we expect will leverage additional uh, capital into the supply chain. And indeed, we're already seeing that uh, in some areas. We're all already working with a number of uh, so, uh, supply chain leads uh, and collaborating uh, with the supply chain. And it's really over kind of five pillars. Uh, you know, we've got investment in, I guess, hard points of infrastructure, uh, like ports and harbours. I mentioned uh, Scraps to Harbour for operations and maintenance. Uh, Scapa Deep Water Key is, is uh, you know, of interest to us. And we would like to sort of co invest with others in that facility. Um, we're looking at collaborative supplier design and supply chain studies, essentially to try and help people uh, grow their businesses so they're ready to, to meet our, our delivery uh, schedule uh, and grow uh, to, to help support us and other projects in Scotland and beyond. I mentioned the Innovation and Demonstration Partnership with EMEC, uh, which is underway. We've got a skills development program that we're working very closely with UHI, University of Highlands and Islands, and with them just now on uh, a STEM program. And again, we've pulled in other Scotland developers into that STEM program. So, uh, you know, I think, I hope the industry is, is sort of moved beyond the competition for Scotland and we're moving more into a sort of collaborative uh, framework. Uh, and I mentioned the Supply Chain and Infrastructure Investment Fund. Just so you can sort of see how that £105 million is sort of split. You know, we're looking uh, at sort of uh, just over £20 million uh, to be spent in the first three years. Uh, you know, I mentioned about EMEC, I mentioned about uh, UHI and the STEM piece. Uh, ports and harbours, I, I'd hope to think that we're getting close to or closer to kind of uh, agreements and alignment uh, on that. Uh, and yeah, there are ongoing sort of technical studies with Global Energy Group and uh, other uh, facilities around Scotland. Um, the kind of next phase would be uh, you know, over £30 million uh, effectively trying to sort of build up the capability and competitive competitiveness. Uh, of the supply chain in advance of a contract for difference award. Uh, and again, trying to leverage as much money from third parties, whether that be government, other developers, uh, so people can co-invest and kind of share risks and indeed opportunities. Uh, and then lastly is a £50 million sort of pre-FID capex. So that's beginning to uh, essentially put down payments down into the supply chain for steel, raw materials, goods, et cetera. And these are some of the alignment partners on the right-hand side of your screen that we've been working with to date and hope to continue to work with um, throughout the project. Um, I'll touch very briefly, I'm conscious of time, uh, on the Flotta Hydrogen Hub. Um, you know, uh, this is a separate project uh, with separate partners and will be subject to a separate planning application. Um, but yeah, working closely with Repsol Sinopec, uh, who are the current terminal um, operator. We're working with Total Energies, um, again, one of the largest offshore operators in the UK continental shelf. Uh, working with Uniper, um, who are experienced in hydrogen production. Um, and we're also working with Green Investment Group, again, part of the, the Macquarie uh, group of projects. So, um, yeah, really excited to, to sort of pull those uh, project partners together uh, around the, the Flotta Hydrogen Hub. Uh, I think Paul touched on this figure, but you can see effectively within the footprint of the existing uh, uh, Flotter oil terminal. There are a sort of tank field that stretches out sort of to the southwest, and it's really within that area that we would look to hopefully develop new hydrogen infrastructure. Again, trying to be sensitive to uh, you know the local environment, uh, landscape, etc. Uh, this figure is slightly outdated. I think whenever possible, we'd look rather than we'd look to put the uh, electrical infrastructure. 
uh, closer to the, the new hydrogen infrastructure. It was it was really just born out of convenience, this figure, because um, Repsol, uh, I believe, own the Galta Peninsula. Um, and that's it. Um, happy to take any questions at the appropriate time and equally happy to hand over control to, to others. Thanks very much, Jack, and very useful to know where we are with, from a developer's point of view. So just to, 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 to start rounding off some of the stuff, we're going to hear now from Gavin a, a Barr, who uh, is, is just going to just touch on some of these supply chain opportunities and how we might start pulling that together. So it's all very well to say, yeah, everybody's supporting the supply chain, but how do we pull that together? How do we make that the most effective for Orkney? So Gavin's got some ideas on that. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. And like we go back to the original presentation with links in your machine, whilst you're doing that, I guess if there's one take-home message from what I'm going to say over the next it's only six or seven slides, okay. is be cautious when Neil Carmore approaches you before Christmas to say, hey, you've got a bit more freedom that you're not within OIC. Can you get a bit more involved in ORF? I mean, we get a bit more involved in dragging together some of this yeah, opportunity in terms of the supply chain. And I said yes. Uh, and here to, to hopefully uh, to, to play a part in that alongside colleagues uh, across ORF in the coming weeks and months. So, yeah, I think Neil, Neil approached me in the back of a, a board meeting himself back in December and uh, asked with, with the, the, the kind of discussion point at that point about ORF taking a more direct role in helping to uh, mobilise some collaboration across the Orkney supply chain, helping hopefully developers like Jack uh, find ways to, to interact more effectively and efficiently and hopefully bring as much of that money and that 60% UK spend in, into Orkney. So uh, this that's the discussion piece today or as we move beyond today as to what role ORF might take in that with the aim of maximising that opportunity for Orkney. So I'm just going to cover these three things. We've had a discussion what the supply chain is, discussing the need for collaboration and then finishing with some discussion points, which I guess I'll leave open for discussion today or afterwards through ORF uh, as we move forward. So if we move to the next slide, uh, and again, my assumption is these slides are available, this is being recorded, so people can take these away afterwards and online, hopefully pick up some of the detail. But the, the sort of arrows there are just to give a, a thought piece, I suppose, of what, what is the Orkney supply chain? There's some very perhaps obvious things we think about and we've heard about today in terms of boats, piers, uh, hard infrastructure and hard engineering experience. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that also contributes to supply chain and is absolutely central. I know Swade and Ruth and the the council team will be thinking about that in terms of the strategy as to how we plan our transport, our the hotel infrastructure, and also our homes and leisure facilities to support what will be a huge opportunity and development of Orkney for the next 30 odd years. I've just taken off the Orkney.com website, the other list of all the businesses that are represented on Orkney.com. So there's a huge long list. I guess what we're trying to channel down just now, perhaps, is a role for ORF and the proposal or the discussion point that ORF takes a more direct role of the energy services supply chain and looking to facilitate further uh, collaboration there. If we can move to the next slide, please, Mike. And this is then the proposition, or if I think through the, the fact that, and this is what the Gareth has done previous to this table here, of just a starting point of taking some of the supply chain companies and the skill sets, the experience, the capabilities we already have, and. The good news is, folks, we're, we're already well, very well placed, uh, not only in terms of the, the hard expertise, skills and experience, but also reputation already has solidified over 50 years since Flota and the last 20 odd years based on the renewable sector, a global reputation as energy islands. So that's a good starting point. And also we all know each other and we respect each other and generally when things uh, come together, we work together to, to support Orkney business the Orkney community and to present for Orkney. That, that generally works well when things uh, need to happen and happen quickly, particularly when Neil phones you up and said, we've got so-and-so coming up next week, can you come out? So it just, it happens. So, but some thoughts, we're not maybe not currently as well joined up as we might be. Um, we do, do we have a set strategy as a supply chain, as a community, what we're trying to deliver and gather stimulated some thinking of that earlier on? It, do we have a clear narrative of what we want as perhaps we do as individual businesses, as a collective business unit and for Orkney, what are we trying to achieve for Orkney in terms of business growth and in terms of investment? Um, and who, who, do, who do people like Jack and other developers go to, to as a first point of contact to understand what Orkney can offer and what the ambition of individual businesses or the collective business opportunity might be? Who is that? As we go through 
Yeah, the proposition is maybe perhaps ORF can take a, a stronger role. So we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so what's the need for collaboration? You've heard about some of this already in the previous speakers in terms of that global imperative. The, the graphic on the right-hand side is just the, the sites that Jack referred to as the lease areas that were released uh, earlier this or, or announced there earlier last year. And the big circle saying Orkney's right in the middle of that. So we're well placed. We've got the harbour. We've got the fact that the developers are already investing. You saw the timeline there from Gareth earlier and then from Jack. So this is happening. In, as businesses, individual businesses, we can do nothing. We can wait and see what happens. It might pass us by or we might get an opportunity. Um, we can focus individually. Aquaterra, we can say we're just interested in Aquaterra, but that's absolutely not uh, our, our business uh, way of working. And the proposition is that that maybe isn't the way that ordinary businesses as a rule uh, want to work and actually we're better working together. And what is good for individual uh, parties is, is better for Orkney as a whole. Uh, so, so there are choices, there'll be other choices. But these are, I guess, just as a thought piece for us mm -hmm. starting to think about what role REF could take in, in working within that environment. Uh, move to the next slide, please. So who, who could be involved? Um, these are just some logos, there are many others, uh, but we do have a very diverse supply chain already. We have that international scope. Many of us operate internationally. I had the call on Friday there where I was pulling into five different time zones in the one hour in the one meeting. So we're already operating internationally and doing business internationally. This is about channeling that focus back on Orkney uh, and, and of what we can achieve for Orkney. Over this last year, a number of businesses have been meeting regularly and some of us here this evening again, just to start to talk about these things and also meeting with the council and hi. Um, and I guess what we're now looking to do is to, to, to move that further forward into a more formal or, 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 or regular route through, through ORF. There's a new role that Ruth and Swain are leading on through the council in terms of facilitating more regular business to business dialogue and now monthly business breakfast meetings. These are excellent to get the dialogue going and to get that intelligence sharing and information sharing. And yes, anything that ORF does, we want it to work alongside and complement that activity rather than duplicate and certainly not to, to conflict. It was an excellent event that Paul and Naomi and the team uh, organised uh, just a month or so back in terms of the specific develop deep water key development and getting supply chain businesses to, to meet the potential contractors for that development project. That was well attended by contractors from across the world, I think. Um, and also by local businesses. And I know myself had a couple of contacts on directly in the back of that. I'm sure others did also, so that was excellent. But the proposition, there's value in more and there's value in a role in, in, in organising internally so that when we meet or we are approached externally, we, we, we know what our narrative is, we know what we're trying, we're, we're needing to say that is of collective benefit and maximises the opportunity for it. <coughs> uh, next page, please. So this is just, I guess, to frame out the gap, the image is again of Orkney.com and just, to, again, my, my interpretation that um, other sectors are, already have a well-established voice, particularly the food and drink, heritage, leisure, arts, they've got uh, representative bodies, there's people, there's individuals, there's officers, that people in, who are interested in those subjects know who to speak to. There's an excellent and very effective role for the public service uh, that is evolving now, looking at that overall Orkney-wide strategy and initiatives, and also channeling developer contacts when people approach the council to make sure that uh, they, they know who to speak to. But is there a one-stop shop, a representative body uh, to begin that journey amongst businesses in Orkney uh, and, and learn that landscape and quickly get to the right place or understand uh, they may know Aquaterra, or they may know Green Marine or whatever it is, but do they know about Arcades or any other, other businesses that are located within the Orkney energy supply chain? And that's where we need that central place to work for. And that's, I guess, the, the role potentially for, for ORF to fill that gap. Next slide, please. There's two to go. Eight, one to go. So listen, you won't necessarily be able to read and absorb all this. And the purpose of this was to act as, a, I suppose, a, a number of discussion points we might want to touch on if there's time here today and or certainly through future meetings of, of ORF. And it's really just my thinking based on what I picked up over a number of conversations as to what the role for ORF might be in representing an energy services supply chain. Um, part of that is establishing and agreeing what that uh, common narrative is, so what, what benefits us all as businesses and as a wider, the businesses within that community of Orkney, what do we all want to see delivered? Um, what do we need as businesses? And Jack mentioned this earlier on in terms of the potential funding that's becoming available through developers and government to support supply chain growth. Is it 105 million? Brilliant, we need as much of that here. But we need to know, we need to articulate individually and collectively what we need, what we want, and what we can accommodate. 
don't just think about what we are now as businesses, but what we might become in terms of servicing this huge opportunity. Uh, and that's, a, I guess, the second point is, is how do we help businesses? Uh, businesses know their business, they know their business plans, they know how to develop their individual parts. But how do we look at pathways that can have collective benefit and help we design services and make sure services are grown here, which have uh, the opportunity to, to do what the Scotland development parties need uh, and future development opportunities that arise, but that we grow that, that business here. Uh, there's the voice for sec the, the sector in, in discussions with the public sector and others as policies and strategies are developed. Again, is there a means of articulating that in a coordinated way? I was uh, one time, I wrote in a slide last night the, 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 the high street shop window and thought Victoria Street's the one street, I think, in Orkney that both Kirkwall and Strummers have. So it's our Victoria Street uh, shop window, i.e., the place in the high street that people are, or in the, in the virtual high street that uh, the first contact can be made in terms of. Uh, developers coming to understand and to meet and to engage with the supply chain, sorry, with the energy services supply chain. <clears throat> um, then there's other roles as well, conferences, with conferences coming up over the summer. Is there a presence and, and, and who represents, as well as the, the, the good work that's done already through the existing networks, who specifically represents or has a pickup for you know, the collective energy services supply chain? So there's lots of work to, to do, and I'm happy to, to, to support ORF alongside other colleagues in, in starting to think about these things. Uh, but we need to develop that role, that mandate, that trust across businesses um, and, and have that dialogue in the coming weeks. And looking to colleagues in the public sector, perhaps, um, there is also resource required. And I'm not planning to the ORF finances yet, but I imagine uh, that although we do have some uh, finance and we do have some staff resource to do this properly and to do this correctly, ORF will need to be resourced in terms of people uh, and also pounds to, to, to do that. And that possibly spreads out wider into the, the wider business, the ordinary businesses. If we're representing ourselves, then fair, fair dues. It's our job but if we're starting to represent a wider ambassadorial role, perhaps uh, that, that, that could, could, could have wider benefits that uh, possible businesses can't support in the traditional way. That was a quick canter through, hopefully within the, the time available. Uh, so hopefully these slides are available on presenting that as a starting point only for OF to consider what role we might have moving forward. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Gavin. And then uh, you'll be glad to know, guys, the final presentation of Sharif is just going to give a sort of brief uh, introduction. Some of you have seen the piece in the paper uh, a few weeks ago about uh, about the mega hub, and, and it wouldn't be a complete discussion tonight if we didn't have a little bit of background on where that's going. So, Gareth, you've got the floor. So I, I think in hindsight, I'm going to maybe put mine a bit ahead of Gavin's because Gavin would have finished off nicely. But um, we've seen um, some immense proposals from effectively one project and, and one of the solutions that Orkney can offer. But if you think back to some of the figures, you know, we've just been talking about the first 30 megawatts, sorry, 30 gigawatts of Scotland round, but there's 150 gigawatts that might be coming to the area. And the challenge there is, um, what's that ultimate solution? If we start delivering bit pieces for the first project, for the second project, is that actually what we need for all the projects going forward? Um, and what does that infrastructure look like? <clears throat> and one of those areas that we've been focusing on is around the maritime side of things. As we know, Orkney has a huge history in, in maritime affairs. Um, thinking back to the companies that are operating here, I think Brian Rendell was the first of the Orkney companies to get engaged in offshore wind servicing, probably in the early noughties. And then with Green Marine and Lease Marine uh, coming along and offering services now, very active in those areas. Um, and ourselves and EMEC and Orkays Marine and various others actively providing services to the sector. That is a growing capability on that maritime operation side. So, um, as I said earlier on, huge potential. And the question is, um, what we've talked about already in SCAP and Flow is not enough to do the job that's there to be done. So it's like looking beyond the deep water key and saying, what can we do that might be in addition to that, that the UK needs to be able to service this growing industry? Um, and then there's a question was, can we fit that into SCAPA flow and is it appropriate for us to do that? Um, and I come back to the point again is, is it something that we want to be control and control of? Or are we going to let and wait for somebody else to do it to us? Um, and in that context, SCAPA flow 
you know, has been mobilized in times of war and crisis by the government to serve a purpose. We all know that history very well. You know, the climate change battle is that. It will involve mobilization, it will involve decisions that we may or may not be part of as a local community when the proverbial hits the fan. So, next. <clears throat> so one way I think which is quite interesting to think about Orkney um, is at different times and at different ways our sphere of influence might change. So this set of slides endeavours to kind of show how at different phases of development Orkney's interests might grow and shrink. So in terms of planning and design work, the companies and the organisations that are involved in that stage of development are not just bounded by the waters around Orkney. We can go anywhere and do jobs anywhere, and indeed do, do jobs all over the place. So Orkney's sphere of influence in that planning and design stage is very widespread, and in fact goes on not just nationally but internationally as well. When it comes to the surveying say, stage, it becomes a bit more local. The advantages that we hold then are limited by distance from port and how quickly you can mobilize people to participate in the surveying. So at that stage, it's going to become more localized and each of the communities will have an interest in having survey teams going out from the local ports to undertake mm -hmm. activities. When it comes to the assembly <coughs> and installation phase, again, that interest will grow because SCAPA flow can become a hub. Um, and as I think Paul pointed out, you know, it's been learned that the distance from the final assembly to the ultimate destination point is absolutely critical. And Scapa flow lies right at the heart of that territory. <clears throat> at the ONM stage, again, it will then relocalize because when you're zipping in and out, you want to be as local as possible. Um, and there'll be a bit of a turf war over the ONM stage. And as we know in the local paper, and I think from local businesses, we're very interested in getting the operations and maintenance jobs associated with all the developments. And, you know, if we can make a case for um, some of the work that's associated with West Orkney Wind to come instead of scraps to come to Orkney and use the established expertise that there is in Orkney in that activity, then that's something that we should really get behind. That might be an, an early target for us to go after. At the fabrication stage, the reality as Jack pointed out, is that a lot of the material is going to come from other parts of Europe, other parts of the world. Yes, Invergordon and places like that are going to have a footprint, but it, and that's something that Orkney isn't particularly <laughs> interested in to date. And then we come to the energy export stage where it can be electricity and hydrogen, and obviously with flotter grid connections, we know a lot about unfulfilled grid connections in these islands. <laughs> Um, I think that's ORF's raison d'etre, isn't it, to speak about the grid. Um, but that connectivity, where these wires go, strategically, there is nobody at the moment looking at the overall piece. You know, obviously, individual developers are looking at their best solutions. But what is the ultimate solution for the 100, 150 gigawatts, and how should that be connected? So Orkney has a role to play in all of these points. And the key thing is that in, in fulfilling a role, I think Orkney's always very good at not trying to squeeze out other people. We're not trying to be competitive with what other people can do better. But what we're trying to do is say, what is it that we as a community can do best and how can we contribute that? So we're not trying to fabricate things. We're trying to bring them together and assemble things. We're not competing with Invergordon. We're, comp we're complementing what Invergordon and other places can do. So one of the areas that we started thinking about was port development. And obviously the ideas for Deepwater Quay as a coastal port um, have been developed and, and been around for a few years. And in parallel with that, we started thinking about what the floating wind sector might need and what the ultimate capacity might be for port developments. And some of you may have seen at the Science Festival a couple of years ago or other events, this idea of a floating facility in Scapa Flow. And over the months and years that we've been thinking about this, the ideas are developing and evolving, but the key fundamentals have never changed about it being modular, about it being floating, and about it being scalable. So it's something that can start small, it can grow and it can shrink, and it can be sailed away at the end of its lifetime if that's what's needed. Um, 
And what's outlined here, in, and you can see hopefully, is that we can start this floating approach as simply as uh, bringing a crane barge into scapa flow, which has the capacity to lift all the, place, the bits into place, delivering the pieces on a barge, bringing a base in and putting them onto each other. And then it can grow at different levels of capacity to be more complex if and as that demand <coughs> grows. And ultimately, um, there was this design, which you'll have seen in the paper um, and in other presentations for a 200 hectare site. Now it may never get to that, uh, it may never be needed, but it, it gives a kind of endpoint that could feasibly be needed to produce perhaps uh, 500 to 1,000 turbines a year, which when we get up towards 20, late 2030s into the 2040s may be needed for the UK to achieve what it's trying to achieve. So thinking about this first stage, there's two technologies that are really uh, around or being developed at the moment, which might be relevant. So the first is an operation like this, as I said, with a jack-up crane, which basically comes into one of the existing anchorages in Scapa Flow. The materials get delivered by barge and it can assemble the turbine in place. There are some companies that are thinking about options for self-climbing cranes as well. And that may be a technology that evolves um, and it'll be interesting to see how crane technology does evolve as these towers become higher. The, the height of the turbines to the blade tip is 300 meters, um, which is very tall. Um, but you know, the crane manufacturers uh, uh, believe it, it's evidently possible. And interestingly, um, the company on Flotter, which was well known to most locals as the Orkney Water Test Center, that's now owned by a company called NOV, National Oil Well Varco is the full name, but they have a subsidiary called Monesto, and that crane was designed, not so not Monesto, Gusto, that's, that's another company, um, by Gusto, and Gusto design and fabricate cranes to go onto offshore wind turbines. So Orkney has basically a, a, an office for one of the world's leading offshore crane manufacturers, which is a nice work of, of fate and destiny, probably. <clears throat> so there may be a need, as well as that kind of more dispersed approach, to have something that's a bit more organized. And we've been playing around with different ways of looking at how modular uh, barge configurations might work. Um, and some of the latest thoughts are perhaps bringing the size of the barges down a bit. So each of these barges would be based on a standard 37, 40 meter by 100 meter barge. And basically being able to moor them beside each other, either through catenary moorings or through piled moorings to create a track way that they can then be linked. And the advantage of this is it provides a lot of berthing space without much real estate space. So if it's a just in time Japanese philosophy where you bring the parts in and you assemble them, something like this, which doesn't have the heterage, you don't have to invest in real estate, might be very effective. And what you can do is then have, go to the next slide, um, turbine jackets uh, or, or uh, floaters positioned on here, and then have the jack-up cranes coming in and lifting the bits from the uh, requisite uh, barge onto the base. Um, now this indicative layout is shown with these two areas next to it. And these two areas represent the single point moorings which exist in scalpel flow already associated with the flotter oil terminal. So there are two mooring buoys which were used by the tankers when the oil used to be offloaded directly into the tankers in the flow. They're now redundant given the, the flow rates that are through. Um, flotter don't intend to use them for exporting oil anymore, but they're serviceable moorings and they might be used as strategic bases within this arrangement if they work used directly, the moorings that are there can be taken away and the space can be used for these other barges. So there's a space there in Scapa Flow, which is effectively already designated for anchorage use, uh, which lies away from other activities. So this is the, uh, the picture that was in, in the paper recently. So there's elements of this that are interesting to think about. Um, there is a deficit of space 
generally in the UK for pulling all of this stuff together. Um, and it's not beyond comprehension that at some stage somebody may say, look, we need to have more capacity and scaffold flow. So I think it's not necessarily disingenuous to say something like that could be required, but it's not necessarily required. And that would probably be into the late 30s and into the 1940s if, if that indeed came about. So in terms of the space, these two green circles are the single point mooring um, areas that exist already in Scarpa Flow. So those two floating barge pontoon uh, structures are shown there to scale. And what you can see is how that fits in spatially wise in terms of the existing anchorages, um, plotter as an operating activity, the deep water key area over here, and some of the other existing development areas at um, Linus and uh, Brineville. Um, the old um, airport of Flotter has been talked about for development at some time. And there are other areas that have been earmarked for possible developments at some stage in the future. So this is one of the things that as a community we need to get our head around is what is Scapa Flow's ultimate capacity? What's acceptable or appropriate to develop in the different parts of Scapa Flow going forward? So why, just to emphasize why Scapa Flow might be important, these maps show other port and harbor areas around the UK, and this rectangle is the same scale in each of the pictures. And, and what that shows is that Scapa Flow, not only is it described as unique, but when you look at it for a practical sense, it is unique. You just can't fit that kind of space into these other port and harbour areas and maintain the shelter. The one that comes closest is, or the two, are the Firth of Forth and the Clive, but the Firth of Forth retains that openness to the east and exposure um, and has a lot more traffic and a lot less space. And the Clive is even busier than the Firth and the Forth, but any of the other uh, areas just don't have the water depth and the space to allow it to happen, or you have to be outside the harbour area. So it was interesting, uh, Paul talks about Aberdeen Harbour, and you look at the bay that got infilled just above the Red Square, that's where the new harbour's been built in Aberdeen. It's tiny compared to the huge volume of Scapa Flow. And as you'll see on the model there, Scapa Flow is big enough that Edinburgh City can actually fit inside Scapa Flow. The whole of Edinburgh to the Ring Road can fit inside Scapa Flow. So floating ports and facilities are not unique. We didn't invent them. We've just applied them to this particular application. Um, one thing that's quite interesting from a national history point of view is that the Falkland Islands port facilities were provided on floating barges that were taken down on a heavy lift vessel, three parts, and positioned in Port Stanley Harbour. So it's, it's been used as a strategic purpose by the Navy um, in, in the UK. There are other uh, schemes that are uh, currently being developed for container ports and other port configurations off Holland, um, off Bangladesh, and off uh, Suriname and Guyana in South America. So this is becoming a worldwide concept that's being looked at for different purposes. But as well as the technology, and, and this kind of relates probably to the supply chain discussions, is that what is our aspiration as a community in terms of how we want any strategic developments to happen? Who's going to operate these facilities and, and how is that going to work? So the model that we have at the moment, the Flotter Oil Terminal, is a major industrial site. I think it's been owned by five operators in my lifetime. Um, and Orkney hasn't had any influence in who those operators are and and effectively how the terminal is managed. We're extremely lucky now that we've got a really loyal Orcadian in Ian Tullock that's manager of the, the terminal. Other managers have been really well aligned with Orkney's interests, but we don't have any tangible input into the decisions that are made. So going forward, if we've got ideas about how Deepwater Key or other facilities such as this could come about, making sure that they're owned and operated in a way that's appropriate for the Orkney community is something that's really key. So creating the supply chain capacity so that we can 
take on more responsibilities than maybe previously is something that's really important and something that the supply chain group really need to address. And that's particularly important in the context of offshore wind because there's quite a hierarchical approach traditionally associated with procurement. They talk about tier one, tier two, tier three contractors and virtually all the all your businesses will probably be tier three and below. So that's a real challenge for us. Can we project ourselves up higher up that supply chain and have more influence <clears throat> or indeed, you know, get involved in managing and owning projects going forward? Um, all of these projects that we're looking at have attracted investment to people that have had the ideas to lead the projects in the first place. So it's not beyond, beyond um, our capacity to do that. So within the context of Scapa Flow, we're looking at the concept of something, an entity maybe called Scapa Flow Futures or something like that, that could be a partnership of local interests, that could be the operating entity, hold the licenses, hold the permits and hold the responsibility for operating the facility and then work with different supply chain partners to actually deliver the means to do that. So the economic benefits that might come from this wider expansion are significant. In monetary terms, a rough back of the envelope estimate suggests that there might be upwards of 70 or 80 million pounds per year coming into our economy from that, and it could support 1,000 to 1,500 new local jobs, both in the port and in the boats that are associated with the port. And a rough estimate of what's going to be needed to deploy that turbine a day is that the whole enterprise will probably involve around 100 vessels. So if you think of those vessels, there's no reason why they couldn't be Orkney-based vessels crewed by people that are living and working in Orkney. We won't get all of them, but we could have a significant proportion of them. So even alone, the vessel opportunities are a significant opportunity for our supply chain. And as well as that, we obviously need to think about the environmental sensitivities. Um, Scapa Flow, as well as a big commercial harbour, is very valued for its wildlife interests and its other activities, such as fishing and fish farming, tourism interests as well. So we need to think about how we're going to be able to manage that. And I'm going to show you some um, data that just is some of the preliminary findings of some early scoping work that we're going through around Scapa Flow. <clears throat> so the first is to kind of map out what are the different impacts that might arise um, associated with, in this case, an operation such as this with a jack-up barge and the turbine. And basically, I'm not going to go through in detail, but it just shows that there's a spread of impacts and activities that include the preparatory works leading to this coming to scaffold flow, the core activities and the other subsidiary activities. We've got marine activities, depending on what operations are underway, there might be onshore, and there's also the supporting activities, which includes critical things such as housing, accommodation, transport to and from the islands. <laughs> this is just a local story, but you know, I, I was meant to be in Edinburgh giving a presentation tomorrow, and the option was fly to Shetland to go down to Edinburgh on the way down, and then fly from Edinburgh up to Shetland and back. It was going to be a six-hour flight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just crazy. So there's a big opportunity for us to resolve transport issues through the level of activity that's going to be associated with this. We need to make sure that all of the things join up. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that in terms of SCAPA flow, we in Orkney know it very well. There's an incredible amount of data and information that has been gathered over decades. Um, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't manage it in a really appropriate way, looking after the sensitivities, but also making the most of it from a community development and commercial point of view. And I've picked two thoughts. One is the visual side of it, people side of it. So this is um, some preliminary work showing different locations in Scapa Flow. And these turbines are uh, 20 uh, megawatt turbines, they're 300 meter to the tip, and it's showing different clusters of locations of where they would be. So it wouldn't be all of the colors together, it might be location X, location Y. And the one that I showed you by the um, quayside are the yellow turbines in these views from Hobbister, from Nest Point and Strongness, 
and from the flotter school. Um, so it gives you some idea of the size of the turbines and what they might be within the landscapes um, that we know so well around Stapa Flow. And just to pick another key interest on the birds front, um, this is some of the data from the uh, PSPA work that was done to designate uh, Scapa Flow itself as a, a provisional SPA and looking at the distribution of species and then the um, obviously choosing places that are either not really crucial for a species or if there's a species that's quite widespread, not choosing hotspot areas, but allowing those species to have other areas that they can go to if development's taking place, it's going to be very important. So just as a reminder to finish off with that whatever we do in Scapa Flow, it needs to be done in a sustainable way based on our consensus, basically, about what's acceptable. That's good. Excellent. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, uh, so that concludes the presentation. should be quite glad to hear. This has been a very heavy session on PowerPoint, but I think it was worth it, and we did or I did let it drift out a, a, a bit, just considering we had some technical issues and it just got a bit slow to start off, so apologies for that. So, but we do have a little time left for questions, uh, and, and that can be online or in the room. I'll, I'll, I'll try, we'll try for a start off to take alternatively. So we'll start with a question from the room, and then we'll go to a question online and back to the room again for a wee while and see how that does, and hopefully we can spend time. Does that work, Mike, for you? Yeah, yeah if people could just raise their hand on... So online, if you want to ask a question online, if you raise a hand, Michael will see that and, and, and he'll either ask you to ask the question or he'll, he'll, he'll read it out. Yeah, I can see Jack's apologies, because that's a drop off, but I can take any Western morning. All right, okay, thanks Liz, that's fine. And, and Paul, are you ready yeah. to answer? Right. Maybe, this will be a short session, so maybe Liz, do you want to come up to the front then, and Gareth and, and Gavin, and we'll just keep them in the corner here to fight it out amongst themselves, but you can, so, any questions from the room uh, or comments? Anybody got a question? Martin Lee has got his hand up. Okay, well, we'll go to online first while people in the room think about one. Martin? <laughs> okay, so first question. first question I have, out of half a dozen actually, but I'll ask it, Jack Farnham. I noticed on your map there was a, an exclusion area called Yankee HMR. It doesn't look to be a marine only thing, it crosses a lot of case nests as well. Is that the main helicopter route? Yeah, Jack's had to drop off, so um, I can hopefully answer that. Yeah, I think it's the main helicopter route. Yeah. But all right, uh, okay. And that there's very, you've got to have a buffer to those so that you um, don't interfere with helicopter flying routes for your turbines. Okay, thank you. Good point. Okay. Anybody in the room got a question? And then or we um. um a very quiet room. Oh, yeah. I'll ask you again. Go on. Yeah, kick it off. Um, a couple of things, actually. Um, the, the presentation this evening were fantastic. Thank you very much for all uh, that. Really, from my point of view, quite very, very um, educational and informative. Um, it started off, you know, about talking about community engagement and how that's an important part of this whole process. And clearly, you know, community not is fundamental to everything that happens here. Um, so, my questions really around that, uh, it's kind of two part, really. So, do we have an idea in terms of the activity around this? You mentioned the kind of timelines in terms of the next few decades. Do you do you envisage a flurry of activity early in that kind of early curve with a peak and dropping off, or a, a kind of gradual increase in activity that the community and environment will, will be able to keep pace with? And then there's a lot of talk, excuse me, around environmental impact assessments. I know Liz, you're kind of excavating on that, but what about community impact assessments? Um, I've been involved in my previous role in policing um, with some of the big projects in Orkney, like the school builds, that type of thing, where we actually saw a negative legacy as a result of a lot of you know, influx of subcontractors, that type of thing, that wasn't probably maybe managed at the early stages. So I just wondered if that's something that's been considered as well, and if not, put some of it is on there. Right. Very good yeah. question, Gordon, and I'm going to hand that swiftly on to some of the other guy to answer. Well, anybody can answer it, but we'll start with you, Gavin, and then we'll let's. Back on okay, that, and okay. then I'll come back well, to we, this and on the direct. Yeah, I think one of the motivations for us trying to start that wider conversation was exactly the point you've made. Um, you know, there's some things that we don't want to happen, boom and bust scenarios, for example. Um, and, you know, 
it's interesting actually, you know, construction versus operations are two very different time scale activities. Um, so um, if we are going to get involved in construction and we probably want it to be long enough and over enough projects that we can sustain that activity so it becomes sustainable jobs rather than just something for two or three years and then it disappears. Um, and yeah, and I think the, you know, obviously the ecological sensitivities are important as well. One of the challenges is with climate change, a lot of those species are going to be changing their distributions. We're already seeing things happening to seabirds and to fish and plankton and other things in our ecosystem that are under pressure because of climate change. Um, and unless we do something to generate renewables to the scale that we can displace hydrocarbons, then we're not going to tackle that. So that's an interesting little conundrum that we need to think about and putting things in the right place. Um, but for me, even though I'm a marine biologist, I think the community benefit side of it and, and avoiding disbenefits is really crucial. Um, and, you know, I think we all know some of the things that have gone on where we got, you know, big loads of imported construction people coming into places. Um, and that has a very detrimental part to our population. So when we started looking at the numbers here, you know, there is a question, I think, for us as a community to say, we've grown from about under 20,000 people in 2000 to 22,000 people now. This looks as though it could lead to another potentially two, three, four thousand people coming to Orkney. Is that something that we are interested in? If it's permanent residence, is that okay? If it's going to be people coming in and living on barges and whatever can take, you know, cruise ships or something like that, what, what does that bring with it? Um, so those are the discussions that I think we're trying to stimulate by saying, what is the ultimate solution over the whole the whole piece? Yeah, I guess from a West Orkney wind farm perspective, we have to do all our ecological studies, the environmental impact assessment, which is quite a well-established process for establishing that, but probably the socio-economic and the social side and the community side are not aware as well-established sort of assessment process. So we've been trying to, the Scottish government are in the process of generating specific guidelines that they're gonna expect those assessments to be done to in the future. That isn't out yet, so we're sort of doing the best we can at the time. So we've done a lot more than we maybe would have done traditionally with other projects in terms of engaging with the community and trying to get the community's feel for what they feel are going to be the big issues from the project. We'll obviously be, as part of our work, estimating the number of jobs, what the types of influx there might be at what stage of the project and on what scale, um, and then that will be presented in our environmental impact assessment, but that will obviously just only be from our project. Mm. And I guess there's, you know, lots of other things going on, like the Scapa Deep Water Key. So I think there is something to think about locally in terms of, <laughs> I've got two hats on here, I've got my Western Orkney hat on and what we'll be doing as a project, but then living in Orkney, and, um, you know, I guess there needs to be some sort of coordination locally on how does that get managed? You know, there isn't really, a lot of the decisions get made by people who are out with the, you know, Marine Scotland make decisions on projects and things. So I think there is definitely something to think about there in terms of yeah, how think, does that get managed from a community perspective? Yeah, I, I, I think the, I think the, having the community exercises of getting the feedback from the community is very important, but actually a lot of the potential impact of these projects aren't necessarily known by the community because we haven't experienced it to that, to that scale. So a lot of learning can be really taken from other, other communities that have had these projects going on in their, in their areas and what, what were the outcomes. It's something that a lot of organisations do when they bring out new policies. Um, what's the impact going to be on you know, people from certain ethnic minorities, for example, or you know, these type of things. But it does, I think, the point you made is, is absolutely correct, I think. It's up joining all those bits up and yeah. all these activities going on, they've got to collect the impact and the be just Paul, just, have you, just, a, just, just oh, a quick follow up from that. Wait a minute, just oh, a So Paul, have you any thoughts from the council side on you've obviously thought about the deep water key and 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 and, and that's going to have a similar impact or something similar to the other one? Yeah, it's just, just to echo what is it said is that it's obviously the impact the environmental impact assessment obviously is a well established thing which is ongoing. Alongside that is that community impact assessment that is something that uh, the consultants are looking at, but again, it's not that well defined of what that is. Um, that's as much as I know. So, yeah, I, I was just going to say that 
I think the um, you talked about the, the the guidance on ethnic minorities and how those are handled. We have our own guidance for islands. It's called the Islands Act, which yes, requires yeah, yeah. the Scottish government to think about the implementation of policies, programs, etc. What this is referring to is a process the Scottish government is undertaking, which, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't had any engagement with the islands to find out what are the social economic pressures that we have in our islands. And yet again, even that act is being used, to my mind, against us because we've got people that don't understand islands making judgments about how a socioeconomic impact assessment should happen within an island context. So this is one of the areas where I think we as OREF as a community, we need to start standing up a bit more for ourselves and starting to tell the Scottish Government, look, if you're thinking about putting this kind of development capacity into our islands, you need to engage with us directly and find out what our concerns, our pressures, our aspirations are, and align those going forward. So that's something that, you know, OREF has been very good at bringing these kind of things to the attention of decision makers on occasions, and you know, maybe this is the start of a a process where we can start to, to do that because as, as they said you know each project is having to look at it from an individual project basis mm -hmm. but the cumulative assessments are not really being addressed mm -hmm. and, and they're really really fundamental for us. Now you're you used to yeah yeah just to add to what um and Paul said I I live um just a part of the project team for the um Scapper and Hatston projects one of the things um we're looking at alongside the EIA is a undertaking an island community impact assessment. So that works well underway. And part of that process is the input from communities, from other stakeholders. And um, so we've been as part of that process thinking about some of the kind of differential impacts across the community, both geographically, but also for different groups. Um, we've been um, linking in with like the work that's been undertaken in terms of housing need and demand and things like that. Um, and also, um, I was involved in the hospital project, so also going back and, and reminding ourselves of some of the things we went through, some of those earlier projects, as you refer to. So that works um, ongoing as part of um, the processes um, for, for the particular projects. I think we'd be doing um, very similar things. Okay, thanks. That's been a good discussion. Uh, got Martin again, if you want. Is, is there anybody else? I'm not, no disrespect <laughs> to Martin. I'm just trying to spread it around because Martin will always have a question. <laughs> Nobody I've got else. Five so. words. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. <laughs> right. I'll just I, ask I one though, that's all right. Um, I noticed that they were talking about consent for the West of Orkney wind farm in 2024 and construction starting in 2027. To my mind, that doesn't leave very long to build the deep water key. And I wonder if they can get a comment from OIC about that. About the time frames for building the deep water key. Yeah, ideally, and again, you know, proposal projects, you you have to look on just timelines on that. The construction period is 2024 to the end of the end of 2026 and full completion quarter one 2027. And if, that's that's how, that's realistic, is it including the building the road to start with and all that sort of thing? Uh all I would say on that is that it's obviously a very tight timeline, but uh, the engineers say it is realistic at the moment. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mark's convinced, but don't mind it. Are we any other questions from the room? I'm trying to keep my room one and then back to Martin, presumably. <laughs> any, anybody else got a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, has the deep water key got anything else to do after the construction of Scotland? Or the West of Orkney Wind Farm, as yeah. yeah, it's very Im Im important to uh, obviously have in a port efficiency and, and usage of the key, whatever gear or key that is, throughout the lifetime of it. You always want to be towards 100% usage at any time. So what we've got in the OBC is a full scaling of not just the offshore wind developers, the ones that we're talking to in their timelines, but also those out of season usage. We can obviously put rigs alongside if the developers don't want that. We're talking with a variety of clients uh, from different sectors, including defence, that are looking at utilising Scapa Deep Water Key. Um, and that will then move on through the lifetime of both the, the offshore wind farms, which obviously go through to the decon phase. Don't forget, yeah. unfortunately, an offshore wind farm isn't for life. It's for 25 to 30 years. But, you know, obviously breaking down everything after the maintenance periods, but 
you're absolutely right. Critical that that's filled in. Is is there a compar- is there a risk comparatively? I mean, they're talking. I think Jack said sort of thirty five year commitment with scrubs that compared with a five three to five year build that that it you know it, we we could be left with something that is not with we're slightly scratching our heads and, and figuring out what we could do with it as opposed to having guaranteed usage for for a long period of time and and therefore an asset we're going to get a lot of return on. Is there a white elephant risk, I guess? 35 years for Scrabster is there, just the O&M side. So that's not for the big heavy equipment. Quite right, three, five years for installation for developer. But then there's obviously the the maintenance, the rebuild side, and everything else through the stages of each staff. Obviously, developers don't want to talk about bringing them back in or anything like that, but there is that side. That's that's our job to fill that in, to fill those gaps, to make sure that we've got something being used. I do that on Hatston and everything like that at all times. We have to make sure that we've got that. Unfortunately, I can't sign contracts for 30 years in time to say that I'm going to get <laughs> people in there all the time. But of course, we're also talking with the other marine renewable sector and companies that are also looking at possibly having bases uh, in Orkney that can utilise uh, where they want to be for their ideal place. On the O&M side, we're also looking at O&M as well, in the likes of Aston. Uh, if you look at East of Orkney, or is there Thistle Winds, or soon to be renamed, they are 27 nautical miles from Aston Pier. Now, our M base is naturally going to be there. That will be a similar to what Scrabs has got with West of Orkney. But it'll be less usage, less ships, you know, so you get. So it's, it's just a balance of that. But you ask if there's a risk of white elephants. There is a certain amount of risk. We have to completely de-risk it, and that's part of the strategy. Can I just... Hey, there you go. Or something as well, you know, like... Plans are plans, and reality is reality as well. You know, I think... Um, it feels to me we've got some outstanding competitive advantages in that O&M space. And, you know, it's worth us continually saying, you know, we've got 50, 60 people that are already in that area. We've got vessels, we've got companies here. It would seem incredible that people are having to operate out of scraps of them operating out of the home base that's here. So mm-hmm. it's up to us to, collectively to make that case. And if there's good economic advantage in bringing that business to what, then we need to make the case too. And I think one, just following on from that, one thing that um, I I thought was maybe missing or or, or wasn't drawn out in the supply chain um, conversation was just, was the people requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a huge, there's both an opportunity, but a challenge. I mean, no one can get any, any qualified people anywhere at all, but, but there's a, if we can start that process now of, of training the people, retaining the people in Orkney, in order to have that skilled up, skilled, um, you know, people base to, to provide that, that would be a huge advantage. Um, but we can't ignore that because it's all very well having the having the ships, but if we, if we want no one to, you know, staff them, then the stuff. Sure. But we, we have got people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we'll for that. Th- thanks for that. Any online? Uh, you, Anne Getchell and Martin Lee. Okay, we'll go for Anne first. No disrespect, <laughs> Martin, but you've had two goals already. I'm hearing a lot of really interesting things that, uh, uh, like a lot of synergy that's going on with a lot of the research I've been doing around here. And uh, I had a couple of questions that through the talks and uh, some responses as well. And um, mostly it's about the capacity and um, what, and, and, you know, sort of figuring out a model for how to manage, you know, the future in a way that is according to the people. Um, First one was, does the Linus and Flata business fall into the INTOG funding um, category? Um, I don't know because it's decarbonization of gas and oil. So I don't know about that. That was one of my first questions. And then I was laughing about Arnish because I don't know how many times it's been funded. So you don't wanna be doing any of that. Um, The other thing was all this supply chain, was that a planned um, coordinated synergy among your talks? Because that's something that's really important. It's, It's just, on everyone's lips at the moment, but um, for to do that, you have to have your 
infrastructure as everyone understands, but also that um, you have to have the housing for that and you have to have the small port, like the small key infrastructure supported. Um, so that, those were just my thoughts. But other than that, I was just pretty excited to hear common, common ground. Um, I had a lot of notes actually. So I look forward to future conversations. Okay, thanks very much. I, I don't know if there was a specific question within that. Yeah, just on this. Yeah, and that, you know, um, not not yeah. to allow allow. Um, you know, you were talking about what happens with 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 the Scapa Key after after the big boom, and you know, and and you see what happened to Linus and to places in other you know other peripheral areas, and so it's really important to plan for for what what kind of activity is going forward. Yeah, thanks, thanks Anne. Yeah, just on the, the Line S with, with Intog, yes, we are talking with developers in Intog for utilising Line S. That's at an early stage, uh, but obviously those, those commercial discussions are ongoing at the moment. So yeah, that but, is certainly part of development and yeah. we are aware of Line S. But as it, it's a priority for investment, you know, it seems like that would be a natural fit. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting a bit short of time. We usually try and wrap these things up by nine o'clock, but I will take a couple of more questions, just saying we, we were a wee bit delayed technology-wise, and it's been short for questions. So is there any in the room first? And if there's not, I'm sure Martin's got a few. He's one. Yeah, Anne. Yeah. Susan. Susan, sorry. <laughs> it was just really when you were talking about the environment, the impact assessments and the islands, I think it's perhaps for Gareth. Where would all this fit with the interconnector and the Finstan substation and all of that huge big picture? Does it, I know it doesn't fit together, but it kind of does because it's all part of... Yeah, so... I don't yeah. know what my question is really. It, I guess that's been a, that, that, that project has been consented already by, yeah. The, yeah. by the government and the council. Yeah, so everything's consented for that project. So. I guess the, the thing for that one is knowing when will they actually construct. And there's and a lot of people and a lot of jobs and a lot of, we're going to need an awful lot of bodies to do all of this. Mm. I think that's really what my question So that's that's where I think the, the cumulative issues uh, that's, come that's, and, yeah. and listen, I would both say, I think that it's it's quite unusual for a community of this size to be, have the prospect of the intensity of transformational development that we're we're seeing. And as I started off by saying, you know, the level of change that Orkney has seen and, and will see, in my experience, is pretty unprecedented in a, in a global I level. think so. I mean, each, not everything is going to happen all at the same time. You know, we know that hopefully the Scapa Deep Water Key needs to come early, the cable maybe, you know, that will be driven by different time scales. But I think although it's looking like it's a lot of development, you know, I think there will be, the West of Orkney Wind Farm, I think, is probably one of the more progressed Scott Wind projects. The ones east of Orkney will be later. So I think there will be some natural sort of play out of the timeline that it won't all happen at once. But, I mean, there is that risk that it might, you know, none of us can dictate what time each project, each project developer will want to do whatever they, you know, their activity. Gareth sitting there with all these little... But it's, I mean, what we're trying to do is raise the question. It's yeah. not, it's, you know, frankly, we're not going to be able, and I don't know, so are these individuals going to be able to control that? But what the question is very appropriate because, as Liz said, you'd hope that it would all work out. But if it doesn't, then we end up in the scenario where you get construction camps and you end up importing two or three hundred people that you weren't planning to do to do a job. And there, you know, somebody else said that the labor market, the way it is at the moment, you may not have great quality control on where those people are coming from, and that's where our problems begin to unravel. And we only need to look to our northern cousins to see some of the pressures that have come, you know, through yeah, too much boom and bust, you know, and there's a lot of legacy that gets left, which has serious implications for the community. So my personal view is that we need to get much better at strategic planning and the cumulative planning and long-term planning to say. What is the ultimate solution that suits Orkney, Shetland, the Western Isles, the north of Scotland? Where do things go? What responsibilities, what uh, contribution are we all going to make? And how do we deliver that? And at the moment, it doesn't feel as though 
anybody or anything is is doing that. Okay, uh, and, and we'll go online for our kind of last question. So we'll go to Martin. He's been waiting patiently. So this well, is your last chance, Martin. Make it a good I, one, yeah. I, 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 what I'd like to say is, forget my last question, because in answer to what Sue has just asked, we need the submarine cable, the, the 220 megawatt one and the substation at Finstown, in order to provide the electricity supply securely to build the deep water port and to be build the strategic base at Hudson for the electricity supplies they will need. So it's not a case of, can we get rid of that because we're getting these deep water ports and so on. We need a huge amount of electricity to run the deep water port in a decarbonised way. And we can only get that securely by additional cables from Scotland. Same with at Hudson. If we, there's a lot of people keep saying, why don't we have cruise ships plugging in we need 8 to 11 megawatts to plug in a cruise ship. We can only do that on a firm basis when we've got more capacity. So the cable's got to come first. If we don't get the cable in by 2027, we won't be able to do a low-carbon construction process in uh, SCAPA. That's the long and the short of it. It's not a question. It's, you know, it's, it's something that we've got to understand. Okay, thanks for that, Martin. I don't really want to get into grid, as Gara said at the beginning of this. We do we do go down that uh, quite a lot within ORF. So I'm going to draw this to a close. I would first like those in the room and even online, if you want to, to just uh, thank the the, uh, the the speakers for for their input this evening. So I think all the presentations have been excellent. So just your traditional. Uh, thank you. <laughs> From a more point of view, my treasurer is still staring at me in the corner here, and he's hopefully staring at everybody as they go out the door. So please, if you feel that this has been valuable or you value ORF itself, go online and, 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 and join if you've not joined already. And if you are a member, please pay up pretty quickly. It always helps us to keep things moving, mm -hmm. moving on. A key point, I mean, the, the ORF board did decide that we would like to be in the centre of this. I've been going back to Gavin's presentation or if board did decide that we would like to take a leading role in this, if people want to get involved in that, we're happy to take that forward through ORF or, or get in touch with any of the directors. There'll be more information on that coming forward. And if people don't think that's a good idea, please come to us. But we do feel that that is a, is a way that, that ORF can take a leading role and try and not, we'll not be able to coordinate everybody because we're a voluntary organisation. And we will, as we're saying, looking at, 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 at the council at high to maybe have a discussion about how we could take that forward as a as a group and, and, and see that there can be some conduit for people, both from developers looking at us, other supply chain companies looking at us, and the public looking back to these things that the ORF can be a, a, a conduit to try and help that. I know the council and high will be doing that as well, but at least there's something that, 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 that people can feed into. So, so that's what the... The decision was at the last or a board meeting and, 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 and Gavin was kind of reiterating it. So so I'd thank everybody for a, a really good, a really informative evening, even though I'm involved in a lot of this stuff. I still found a lot of good information tonight, so I hope everybody has. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much to the speakers again. And just keep an eye on the press for the next door of meeting and, and, and we have them regularly. So thank you all very much.